Welcome everybody to a getting colder night in November in Ontario. I just heard in the news tonight that we're going to have more snow than usual in the uh, GTA and I notice that's where many of you are from. Thank you for choosing to tune in tonight to Play and Digital Tools in the Early Years with Tina Zita. I was pretty excited to actually meet her a couple of weeks ago at a conference and uh, I know that she's got some great stuff for you tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Tina from Peel area and uh, have a good night and good night and forget to put any questions in the chat if you need to. Go ahead, Tina. All right. Hi, folks. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I'm a modern learning resource teacher with the Peel District School Board, which means I have the coolest job. I get to help educators from kindergarten to grade 12 support uh, innovation and trying to integrate digital tools into our everyday practice. Uh, so, but in my former life, uh, I was a primary teacher. Uh, it sounds terrible that I have to do. I was a grade one teacher for many years, as well as an early literacy coach. Um, and at that time, I always used computers. So it's kind of been a lifelong career path to look at how we can meaningfully integrate digital tools into our everyday practice. I said I'm a social media aficionado because it sounded better than an addict, uh, but I probably have a problem with social media. So if you want to connect on Twitter, uh, if you're more of a Pinterest fan, I am on Instagram, just don't share as much educational stuff um, and blog and all that jazz, but Trish already posted uh, my About Me page into the chat box. So feel free to connect at any time and I'll leave my info at the end as well so we can connect there. So looking, um, as I was preparing for tonight, I really started thinking about my own journey with digital tools. And my very first job um, in Peel was actually as a computer teacher before I even got a grade two classroom. And uh, I had no clue what I was signing up for, really. I don't know if anybody does. I walked in, and the whole lab was uh, sitting in the middle of the room, and it was connections I had never seen. Uh, but as I moved into my first grade one class, we started getting projectors. And it was the first time we really saw it, not necessarily as a lab and as a skill to acquire, but really as a tool to enhance our learning. So I can still remember getting all my grade ones in a huddle around uh, our screen as we were looking at sketching out how we use our feet and uh, creating a mind map that projected up with images. And at that time, it was mind blowing doesn't really feel that mind-blowing right, uh, right now. Uh, but then came the iPad. It's hard to believe the iPad's only 10 years old, less than 10 years old. And I remember getting my own personal iPad and bringing it into a classroom and just seeing how that mobile technology really changed the game, how kids started to come and tap and explore, um, and how the camera changed our experience. So now we were able to record and reflect and tap into those apps that allowed us to publish and create, um, where traditionally that was really pretty hard for um, kids to do. Now we were able to do it just um, intuitively, and most of the kids uh, would beat me to it. And then that led to a few inquiries. I'm going to share one inquiry in particular in a bit, uh, but it started with working and collaborating with a colleague that I started my teaching career with. And she had some awesome kids. We just walked in, and we had a few friends that we wanted to work with. And we started with an app called Sketch Nation Create, which I did not think these kindergarten friends would be ready for, lots of text. Um, so we sat down, and a few friends created their first game, and it was awesome. They went to share it with the principal. And I went back two, three months later, and uh, the whole class was playing games. And I didn't quite understand why, because I hadn't shown the whole class. Uh, but one of the friends had taken it upon himself to help others learn what the app was all about. And it really reminded me of that quote from How Learning Happens, uh, that really children are competent, capable, and uh, rich of that complex thinking. And as I watched uh, Noah and some of his friends really explore different digital tools throughout the year, I was really reminded of that role technology can play to really showcase their uh, capabilities and to show us how 
engaged and complex their thinking can be when we give them that um, awesome provocation or that great invitation. But before we dive, oh, I forgot I said this. Um, one of the other pieces that we're probably going to see surface as we go through tonight is the link to the global competencies. Um, so you may have heard of them. I know we probably heard of them the most because they were in the um, report card update post that the Toronto Star put out. But we've seen these C's in many different formats over the years. We used to call them the four C's of 21st century teaching and learning. So it was creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And then Fullen, when he started doing the reports for the ministry, added citizenship uh, as well as character education. And then in this latest resource, and Trish has dropped in the discussion paper if you're really interested, the ministry explored what these global competencies could look like. Um, and at the end of the document, you can actually find uh, the six global competencies that they're exploring. And as we go through tonight, uh, maybe it's just a little seed we plant in your mind as we're exploring, but I think we'll probably see a lot of these um, competencies come into play. For, in my experience, I've definitely seen that collaboration, uh, the communication, the critical thinking and problem solving as we explore materials and as we um, explore the digital tools, and definitely that innovation and creativity that we see so frequently in the early years. So before we get started and dive in too far, we want to take a moment to introduce ourselves. So just in a chat window, if you don't mind just telling us a bit about yourself, where you're coming from, uh, we'll try to get a sense of grade levels and some of our favorite tools in a bit. But just in the chat box, introduce yourself. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Sue. Twenty-four kids, Michelle. I know it's hard. Nice to have you with us, Naomi. Nice to have you with us, Melanie. The things we're going to talk about today, some of them have been inquiries we've done with kindergarten, but definitely uh, possibilities for all of the early years. So hopefully um, we can all take those ideas away. Julie, nice to have you with us. And Nancy, wow, 29 kids, Nancy. I know they, uh, a lot of little bodies. It's great to see some Peel folks. Hi, everybody. I'm not keeping up fast enough with all of your posts. Lainey, glad to have you. Bring that different uh, perspective from the North. Ah, uh, Nancy, that's true. That's what I've loved so much about all of the inquiries we've done, is really getting to know those individual learners and their passions and their interests. Sina, glad to have you with us. And Sarah. We'll give folks just one more minute if they want to do their introduction, and then we'll go to our next question. So our hope tonight is I'm going to share a little bit about my journey and the inquiry. We're going to try to show you some apps. Um, hopefully the technology um, cooperates with us. It did the last time, and we tested it. Um, so I'll show you some quick free apps that we can try. Then we'll share a bit of a bigger exploration. And then we want to end our night tonight with brainstorming some possible ideas, um, linking maybe the play that your friends are engaging in with some open materials you have and what possible tools could work. That's a hard part of all of this joy, um, all of this work, as you mentioned, Nancy, that finding the right tool and the right provocation or invitation for the right friend um, is always part of that art of teaching, isn't it? Okay. You can keep introducing yourself in the chat box if you want, uh, but we're going to just move to the next slide, and we're going to use that clip art you guys did in the little walkthrough. So the image icon, let me see if I can just point to it here, this little image icon here, 
still go to the common symbols. And if you just want to drop your um, symbol where it best represents you, we'll kind of get a quick visual of our crew. So it's looking like a lot of kindergarten friends, some other amazing roles, which I love. Karen, you teach all of those? Sounds like a cool job. Is it a family grouping or more planning time? Wow. Sorry. That's pretty cool. I think some of these provocations may be interesting then. Glad to have you with us, Liz. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the next question, if that's okay. So thank you very much for that. It's cool. A lot of our um, examples today will be around the kindergarten years, but we'll definitely talk about how it's branched out into other um, grades as well, especially grade one. OK. Our next question is just to give me a sense so that when we're brainstorming, we link to some open materials that you have. Um, so if you could use a text feature, uh, that would be great. So there's this little, let's see if I can point there again. There's this little text feature. And you can either click uh, right on the page, or if you're using the mobile app where it's easier, just put it into the chat box. So what are some of your favorite open materials, um, or what is some of your friends' favorite open materials right now? Oh, sorry, uh, Julie. Uh, open materials are just loose parts, uh, items that weren't necessarily meant for play, but um, items that allow for open explorations or different uses. Somebody else can jump in and <laughs> probably define it better. Uh, so for me right now, I have some Scrabble, old Scrabble tiles, some Lego, some rocks, and sticks, um, which all can be used in different ways, if that makes sense. Gems. The kids go crazy for the gems. We were doing some stop motion last week with grade twos. And man, those gems were the highlight of the day. One of the coolest open materials I saw last week walking by a classroom was using scarves. I never thought of that. I'm not sure why I didn't, uh, but it was so cool to see the kids exploring and creating with them. I need to use more fabric. Great suggestion. So small wooden cubes, pop tabs, blocks, Play-Doh, Lego, wooden blocks, awesome, rock shells, bead gems, Scrabble tiles, plasticine Lego. I love Scrabble tiles. I never would have thought of it, uh, but my mom was getting rid of an old game as they were moving, and uh, they've been some of the greatest open materials that we use across the grade levels, all the way up into the intermediate years even. Laney, a great suggestion, getting those scrap wood pieces from high school. I love that idea. There's so many great um, folks using open materials in awesome ways. So I can't wait to see where our conversation goes. Awesome. OK, the next question, uh, we want to keep getting to know the group and seeing the different tools and ideas that we use. So for the next question, we want to kind of think about uh, what are the tools you're currently using? So I was thinking of this in two ways. Maybe what kind of devices are you using? Do you have robots in your room? Um, are you using more iPads, iPod touches? Is it computers you have access to? Uh, just kind of what does that look like? What devices do you have access to? And then on the other side of our screen, we kind of see those apps and sites. Maybe you have some go-to uh, tools that you like to use that are more app-based. 
So if you want to use that text tool again um, to add to the screen, or if you want to add it into the chat box again, let's kind of brainstorm some of those pieces. Awesome. So I see iPads and Chromebooks, which is fantastic. I find to me with uh, Play, I love the iPad. And it's probably, I love the iPad to begin with, so I may be biased. Uh, but it definitely gives us that mobility to be uh, organically part of the Play, which I think is kind of key as we're trying to um, incorporate the devices more fluidly. I don't think fluidly is the word, but we'll make it up. <laughs> So I see some more iPads, computers, smart boards, document cameras, awesome. Doodle Buddy and Pic Collage, cool sketch. I was just, uh, had a colleague on Twitter just recently share how her students are taking on the documentation themselves in Pic Collage. Just so amazing to see. Oh, I love somebody's using Flipgrid. That's awesome. Oh, chatter picks. We're going to chat about that slightly tonight. I don't know why I said slightly, but that will be one of the ones on the list. So that's awesome. I love Sketch. With the new updated iPad, you also have the annotation features built right in, which is awesome. Coda pillar. That's awesome. Coding mouse. Cool. Seesaw and Picklage. Loving it. So many great ideas. We'll give you just another 30 seconds if you want to post another idea. Oh, I'm a huge fan of Osmo. I was a little skeptical when I first bought Osmo, wondering if um, it would be as interactive as I had hoped it would be. And it kind of blew my mind to see what would happen when you brought a group of kids around to Osmo. So that conversation that comes from being in a group uh, and that problem solving and, and the back and forth as they discuss possibilities. Now do you use the uh, uh, doing green screen app? That would be kind of my go-to. But there's also the TouchCast app for green screen. We're going to share a little bit about our inquiry with that as well. Awesome. So many. Michelle, you'll have to tell me how you like the Brightspace ePortfolio tool. We got in before the um, new app, so our experience was a little different. Love to hear some feedback now, what folks are thinking. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, so many great ideas and so many great ways that you're already using digital tools, and I think it's going to lead really well into our conversation. And um, just allow us to kind of build on all of the great understanding that you're already bringing into the table. As we go through, um, we are going to try to pause every now and then to see if there's any questions. But please know you can post a question in the chat at any time. I love being able to see your ideas and be able to jump off those. So um, it should add to our whole experience if that's OK. Thank you, guys. So when I was preparing for today, and as we were preparing for some inquiries last year, one of the things that I started doing was going through the program document and just looking for where technology is mentioned. And one of the places that technology is mentioned, there's actually a whole little blurb about it, on the role of ICT on page 105. I think we're going to drop the link into the chat box um, if you want to read that section and add any other words that jump out to you. But as I was reading it, there was a couple of words that really stood out to me. That idea that we want technology to extend and enrich the learning that happens in the classroom, that we want technology to be able to connect classrooms. So the idea of using Flipgrid, that's awesome. So many possibilities to connect across different schools and across the provinces, across the world. Um, but really, that idea of a natural extension kept coming to mind. So the idea that technology doesn't necessarily become an add-on or that we necessarily see it 
um, glaring at us as we walk into a classroom, but really that it becomes a natural piece of that environment. And then it was really cool to see how technology also was mentioned to be a tool for communication. So as we're playing with um, open materials and as we're engaging in those play experiences, maybe sometimes the technology just plays that role for capturing the thinking um, and capturing that conversation. And at other times, maybe it plays a different role. The other page that came up to mind from the document was um, this page. And this actually comes from the problem solving and innovating frame, the overview of the frame, not the specific expectations. Uh, and it just made me really think of the experiences I had with students. So I'm just going to give you a minute maybe to read through some of those words that come to mind, uh, the words that they pulled out around innovators. And if you want to drop into the chat box or put a clip art beside the one that you feel really stands out to you, we'll take it from there. Investigate. Definitely um, an interesting one, isn't it, Melanie? That idea of exploring and pulling apart. Uh, I always think of kids with Ranger Ridley's um, kindergarten bio books that he does in the fall and in the spring, and how uh, kids take that closer look. Taking risks is definitely um, something that comes to mind. I love uh, the check mark on persevere, because that's the one thing I've noticed with coding specifically, that kids often are willing to persevere uh, through the mistakes, through the hiccups, when they sometimes won't perse persevere um, in other ways um, or in other scenarios. Asking questions, definitely. Are adaptive and flexible? That collaboration keeps coming up. And I think we see that with play, don't we? We see kids interacting. I always think of the BBC series that follows the four-year-olds. Does anybody watch it? Uh, and they had this whole scene this week that they posted where one of the friends was not happy. And how much collaboration comes back to that communication piece of being able to collaborate is linked back to how well we communicate. Cool idea about using the STEM challenges for perseverance. And really, the reason this image always stood out to me was because that's kind of what I've experienced as we've played with digital tools um, and play, uh, especially when we move away from maybe uh, more of the app-based explorations into some of those open explorations. And Mitch Resnick has a great article where he talks about apps that have high ceilings, low floors, and wide walls. So apps that have lots of possibilities for growth and different uses. Um, low floors so that they're easy entry level. There's not a lot of learning the app before they can start playing and exploring. And then wide walls because we can use them in many different subject areas. So it's not just a literacy app, but we can use it in many different ways. Uh, so that's great to lead us into our exploration. Uh, if it's OK, Laura, I'll jump in on the K bio blitz, the kindergarten bio blitz. I'm just going to put the hashtag in here. Uh, Maloney, you can um, bio, let's fix it if I'm wrong here. So every spring and fall, uh, our outdoor ed coordinator in Peel does a kindergarten bio blitz. So every day you have a little bit of a challenge to explore as a community, and then you tweet your results to the hashtag and to Ranger Ridley. And he'll connect with you, he'll help you identify the species that you found, um, he does really crazy stuff like putting worms on his face. Uh, it wasn't really a worm, it was a centipede. <laughs> uh, but definitely uh, freaked me out. But just a really great way to have that global connection. They do a lot of awesome stuff through EnviroEd. So definitely something awesome to check out. Ooh, a wolf spider in your K-yard. That sounds pretty freaky. I don't know if I could handle that. <laughs> All right, so our question, uh, or the question that kind of came to me, uh, I don't know if I believe it's harmless, but okay, 
<laughs> I actually love spiders. Spiders don't freak me out. Uh, birds, on the other hand, that's another story. So for tonight, uh, I really came, wanted to focus on a question that I've been kind of dealing with, which is how can digital tools become a natural part of the play experience? So a lot of times when I get emails for tools, which is awesome, people are looking for literacy apps or numeracy apps, they're looking for those independent explorations, which are great ways for kids to use the devices, but I kept wondering if there's another way, a way where the devices really don't stand out, but they meld into the whole learning experience. Um, so that's kind of been driving me the last couple years to try some different explorations in different classrooms. Uh, and it really kept, it really reminded me to keep coming back to that definition or, of, of play or what I considered play to be, uh, especially in the early years context. So uh, what kind of play did I really want to foster or what kind of play did I really want to encourage with my learners? So as I was exploring, I really wanted that play that sparked um, inquiry explorations that really built on their curiosities and all of those words we saw in the innovators um, graphic that is in the kindergarten document. And I think uh, I never really saw it as clearly as through some of the dash explorations that I've experienced in the last little while. But before we move on to the dash experiences, are there any uh, questions or comments Maybe you guys can just give us a thumbs up or the little happy face if you've tried Dash or any other robot with your friends already. All right, Laura has. Lainey hasn't yet. Karen has, awesome. All right, for those that haven't checked it out yet, all right, Hasina has. Um, awesome, Nancy. That's cool to have the grade two class lead you. So there's lots of robots out on the market right now. Uh, I've had Dash for two and a half years, I guess. Uh, it was actually purchased through the early years department in Peel, uh, and we just started exploring. So I love Dash for the early years. One, because it comes with three apps. So if we're not ready for coding yet, we can really use it as a remote control. Uh, but then there's also a drawing app, so we can move our way up to the coding. And then I've been surprised. I have a lot of K friends that are ready to dive straight into the block coding app, um, as well as early years friends. And the conversations are just pretty crazy um, to see where they lead. So the first time I ever brought Dash into a classroom, was actually my friends there on the left-hand side. Uh, and nothing like bringing a robot into a K classroom um, to start some excitement. Uh, so there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of curiosity. And as we started exploring, we were just using the remote control app to get him moving around. And what we realized even before we started coding is we started using the open materials in their classroom to start problem solving. So we actually designed our own pathway for Dash. And the reason you see all the kids spread out is we wanted to make sure Dash wouldn't get hurt. So their suggestion or their strategy was to make sure they were all spaced out so we could capture Dash if he fell down. It was interesting to see how that just led into um, trying to get Dash to go up a ramp and building a ramp that he could go up. Uh, we didn't quite, we weren't quite successful with that that time. Uh, but definitely, uh, a lot of opportunities there for exploration. So I know it sounds very simple, but it was a really interesting way to just get into it. Uh, I don't tend to go in through Wonder, Laura, great point. Um, but some of the, I usually start with an invitation or a provocation. So the one you actually see in the middle was we designed um, something for Dash so that he could push objects around the room. The other thing we've done with Dash is we've given them to some friends and we asked them to uh, use the Lego to build around him and create something that he could carry around the room. Uh, but usually to start off with, we'll just start off with a little challenge of either navigating Dash 
through some objects we have on the carpet or um, letter tiles. We did that with um, one kindergarten classroom. They had some different letter tiles, so we spread them out and tried to manipulate dash through some different areas. Uh, we've also had dash with one class. Um, they were really into coding, so we then tried to get Dash to go from one end of our carpet to the other, and we problem solved all of the code we needed to use um, in that process. Now, if you're just getting started and that feels a bit too open-ended, um, I will tweet out and I'll email Trish um, some prompts that someone shared on Pinterest. They're really cool. Let me see if I can actually get them while we're talking. So really cool um, ideas that just start with some basic code blocks, but could be some interesting um, explorations and um, provocations. So they actually ask you to turn dash into different things. So I'm just going to get the robot board here for you guys. Thanks for the moment. All right, sorry about that. So I've blocked a bit about my grade one moment, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So that's the link Trish shared. Uh, and then I've just linked a Pinterest board I have where I've just been pinning some different robot ideas. Uh, so there's the coloring robot, but then you're going to see those dash and dot um, challenge cards as well as a little cheat sheet with the visuals. We've used that a lot with kids. The other one that would be handy is the iBook that they've created um, that has some ideas for the early years um, just to get you started and get exploring. Because I know it's a bit apprehensive when we're not used to robots. What I do love about Dash is that we can use those open materials, whether it's Lego, uh, whether it's other objects. Um, if you ever watch their TV show, they dress them up all the time. Uh, but it does mean that the materials in our environment can enhance that exploration. So one of the things we were using with a grade one class recently was using the sum blocks um, and a grid and dash and have him code um, to different, uh, using his skip counting to kind of create a path through the grid. The other thing we did was we used uh, different symbols for a story and we had them code dash through our grid, um, making sure he hit all of the pig's homes before he made it um, to the brick house, avoiding the wolves. Uh, what I love about that stuff is they can also become explorations that we do with no tech. So they can be um, some unplugged coding activities we do as well. Hopefully I answered your question, Laura. I don't know if I've really tapped on it yet. So one of the more uh, elaborate lessons or explorations that we've had was last year we actually worked with some grade one students that had been coding for a, a while in their class. Um, so these guys actually had done a bunch of coding with their teacher librarian and they were, the classroom teacher and the teacher librarian were looking for some ways to really push their thinking a little bit. So they were working on community and we knew in math we wanted them to use positional language um, and do those calculations. Uh, so we actually set up a little challenge using those old school hundreds carpets. I don't know if anybody remembers them, but uh, they're still kicking around in some schools. So we pulled it out. These guys even had the building shapes, so we laid them out. And the challenge for the small groups that came over was to code dash through the community so that he would see uh, dot, which is Dash's friend, that little circle here that you can probably see. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know how this would go because we never had done if-then statements with grade one. Uh, it's usually something we do in the junior years. Uh, and this group of girls, I think, made my day or made my year. I don't know really which one to say. Uh, so as we were exploring, it was just amazing to watch. They uh, had figured out earlier that each square was 20 centimeters. But one of the friends didn't know how to count by 20s, so she counted by twos, going two, four, six, eight, eighty, uh, and then could justify her whole thinking process to the rest of the group. Uh, then we had just this excitement as they problem solved and tweaked their code to the point where dot and dash saw each other, and then they had that awesome response. 
So it's really cool just to see how Dash can become part of that learning environment and not maybe always uh, the only player. And to your point, Nancy, I love those digital tools that give us multiple possibilities and opportunities to grow. Um, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for devices that can switch and change based on our students' interests and passions and the learning that we want to challenge at that time. Any questions around Dash? Comments? Maybe you've done something with a robot. No, Dash is just one of them. I know some schools have spheros. I've seen some great work with Autobots, especially in the early years, drawing story maps, um, lots of different explorations there. Some folks have the Beebot. Uh, or the Blue Mouse game. Just give you a second if anybody does have a question. So, Michelle, um, I'm always lazy. <laughs> It, Dash is Bluetooth enabled, but I do find Dash connects a little easier. The new Spheros connect a lot better. You just um, hold your Sphero to your iPad and it magically syncs. Um, if anybody experienced the old double tap feature, uh, it wasn't always that awesome. And I know for us in one kindergarten class, we, um, we were using the Draw app, which was awesome. The kids loved it, but we kept, the Spheros kept dropping on us. So we did find that trickiness that you're, you experienced, Michelle. The newer ones are 100 times better for that connection, uh, but I find Dash is pretty solid. So 30, 40 minutes of charging, and you're good to go for a good solid part of the morning. Uh, I learned from my mistake. I tried to do like these mini charges in between, but if I charge them overnight or charge them before while well, I'm doing email in the morning before work, uh, he tends to hold his charge longer uh, through our explorations in class. Cool. All right. So uh, that really led to an inquiry we explored last year. So last year we tapped on a few classes. It was, we didn't have a, a lot of money. We would have loved to have more people jump in. But we were looking at uh, at that question that we really talked about before. How can we use open materials, those loose parts in our classroom, the digital tools at our disposal, and integrate them um, smoothly into the play that the children were experiencing? So we started trying to think of the tools that we possibly could use, everything from stop motion uh, to those squishy circuits to robots, uh, looking at some of the pieces like um, Kaleidocam, or Chatter Picks Kids. Then we were looking at tools we had already started using, Shadow Puppet. Uh, we did some really cool work with the Slow Shutter app. Has anybody done light painting? It's a really cool concept um, that we started exploring with a kindergarten class and just interesting to see how they would paint with lights and how we could bring that into some of those uh, literacy pieces that they were working on as a class as well. And then documenting with a tool like Book Creator. So I thought right now I'd show you two of those apps and how I use them, uh, if that's OK. And I'm going to try to switch to my iPad. So I'm going to keep the chat window open so I can see what you guys are saying. So if it doesn't work, please let me know. Um, we'll try to do some feedback loops here. Uh, and I'm going to start with Kaleidocam. So one of the reasons I'm starting with Kaleidocam, one, it's a free app. So we love free apps. Free is always good. The other reason uh, I love Kaleidocam is because out of the six classrooms that participated, Kaleidocam was the one that they all enjoyed and that they all used. Uh, it is definitely more of an exploratory app, so I don't think it has as much um, diversity as perhaps Dash would. But definitely is one of those easy entry apps uh, that has some different possibilities for us to explore if that's OK. Now, there were lots of questions that came up through our inquiry. Uh, and I think, Trish, hopefully I gave you the right link on that page. Uh, there should be a link to Stephen's uh, documentation panels of our exploration. 
I can't take credit, Stephen did all the work. Um, so after our increase, Stephen, Mr. Koshbura, Burba, Koshbura, Burba, I'm saying his name wrong. I'm so sorry if you can hear me. Um, he did an amazing job at just documenting the learning from our day of exploration as well as some of the learning in his classroom. Uh, so we had educator teams from Riverside, uh, uh, Floridale, and Briarwood. So, so grateful to them for giving of their time and learning together. Okay, let's do this. Let me show you Kaleidocam. All right, just one second as we get the digital stuff all ready. So if you have any questions so far, I want to drop them into the box. Let me know. All right. Ah, it's not coming up. Just a second, folks. Sorry. This is what happens. It's so clean and fast when we do it in the test, and then it went to sleep on me. All right, one moment. All right. Let me know if you can see uh, the iPad screen. Just give me a thumbs up if you don't mind, or so we can drop it into the chat box for me. Awesome. Okay, we're just going to give folks just a second or two to make sure it pops up. Awesome stuff. So I'm just going to show you, this is pretty sad, uh, I'm sitting here on my bedroom floor because that's where my modem is. So I just have some open materials here. Uh, I walk, I travel with these jars, it's pretty funny. Uh, just so you can kind of see what that looks like before we get into the app. So the Kaleidocam app I actually got from a great person on Twitter, her name's Kathy Hunt. She's the iPad art room uh, person on Twitter, and she has a great website. And so she was talking about using Kaleidocam just for students to both create and then taking those pictures and remixing them again. What was cool with Kaleidocam was just to see where different people in the group kind of took it. So I'm just going to open it up. It's there on the bottom. Kind of looks like an old school kaleidoscope. Uh, and when I open it up, I'm just going to rotate here. You can kind of see that it automatically creates a design from the objects that I put on the floor here. Now if I click on the bottom, I can actually change this exploration. I know, Leslie, it's all a cool factor here. <laughs> so we can actually change this exploration. So I can uh, go to less rotations or more rotations, uh, getting into really cool design and Mandela's um, explorations there. Now, beside uh, our tools on the bottom and our little slider to make more or less, we can make that grid design. That kind of looks pretty cool. And all we have to do is snap that picture. So kids can explore and re-explore those objects at any time. I even layered this, so if we're dealing with our grade ones and grade twos, just even exploring lines of symmetry, not as pretty or as cool, especially in this lighting. Uh, but a cool way for us to really get into those different lines of symmetry. So that just has two or three, I can't even tell there, several, <laughs> uh, and different explorations. One of the things we were exploring as a group was actually looking at letters and seeing what would happen with letters as we manipulate them. Unfortunately, my letter is too small right now. Uh, but what was really cool with the group was that the um, some folks actually explored it with their water tables, and they had uh, water beads. Um, some of them just explored the objects in their water tables, which was super cool. 
But what was really interesting was how Stephen had his students reimagine their artwork with the app. So once they had created some artwork, then they used the Kaleidocam to remix their artwork. So as we're looking at that sense of color and exploration, um, seeing what's possible or what happens over time, it was just a really amazing use of the app. Now, to me, I think it's one of those really cool pieces about this app is that we can then uh, take those explorations and take those pieces and um, remix them. So because they're just a picture, we could print them out and cut them up. We could use them as a provocation or an invitation for creating with open materials and seeing if we could create something sim similar. All right, it seems like a lot of people want to see the name of the app. So let me just hit this out so you can see it a bit again. So it's down there on the bottom. Uh, I'll probably have to pull it up here. Good time for a software update to come in. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and you know, I'll know my password now. Uh, so it's right there on the screen. Go light a cam. I'll just type it all the way up here so you guys can see a bit better. So free app. And anybody that's trying it out tomorrow, you're going to have to let me know what you think about it. Awesome. Any questions around Kaleidocam? Thanks, Trish, for dropping in the link before we look at another app. OK. So another one that's quick and simple and just gets us started would be Chatterpix Kids. And I know a lot of people have looked at Chatterpix before. Uh, but I do love it as a way to extend that play and that exploration. So Chatterpix Kids wasn't one that really I had at the top of my list when we first started the inquiry, but as we were exploring in the classrooms and playing, it was interesting to see how much it could link to the materials all around them. So I remember sitting in a classroom once with a friend that was creating this amazing drawing uh, and just pulling out Chatterpix Kids so that they could bring that drawing to life. There was another one where some friends were working on working with some open materials and looking at some play with numbers and bringing in Chatterpix to bring that object that they created to life um, was just really amazing. So there are two versions of Chatterpix. I would always go with Chatterpix Kids. It just gives you stickers that are more appropriate. Uh, how many people, has anybody tried Chatterpix Kids? I know it was on our list before. And if you have any suggestions for those folks that did use it, just let us know and drop it. Oh, awesome, Naomi. Just uh, add your suggestions into the chat box, and that would be awesome for us all to work from. Hey, awesome, Melissa. So I just used some of my open materials here to make my little man uh, from the amazing Syrian artist that does all of his artwork with stones and sticks. So I'm just going to take my picture here. And that gives me my image. And I'm going to draw a mouth on my creature or that I've created. And I just record my message. It will count me in. I'm a cool stick man that loves to hang out with the OTS crowd. I only have 30 seconds, so it does keep it nice and short. Uh, and then we can play it back. You won't be able to hear it, unfortunately. Just trust me. <laughs> and once we're ready, we can re-record, or I can go next. And they even have some features so you can bring in and personalize our character here with some glasses and some other, other features. So what was really cool with some friends is we just built on their exploration with characters in a story. Uh, one class, we actually brought the iPads outside and started um, documenting items we saw outside and giving them a voice. Uh, like we said, so many possibilities for it to integrate into those explorations we're having in the classroom already. Anybody have any other suggestions for Chatterpix Kids? Ideas? Oh, 
we'll just give you a minute to drop a question in if you have any. And then we'll share a bit about our green screen exploration. And while we're doing waiting for the questions, I'm going to switch back and turn off our screen sharing. Okay. No questions yet. Feel free to drop them in at any time. <laughs> uh, that's a great point, Michelle. Uh, and for some friends, the recording is just so exciting that first time around, right? Uh, so the friend that we started off with, with a grade one class, we actually used shapes. And they had to tell us, the shape had to tell us about himself. So we had to pretend like we were the shape, bringing in a bit of those drama skills. Um, and the 30 seconds keeps it shorter. Uh, so that they don't get too long with their talking. Um, like I said, one of the classes, they were working on caterpillars and using open materials to create legs. So I had him talk about the legs that they um, tell us about his caterpillar and what he knew about his caterpillar. Loving Laura's idea about social stories, great for that. Thanks for sharing your tweet there. Oh, I love that you used your artwork there, bringing your artwork to life. That's awesome. Cool, bringing it in so that they could share about their increase. Another one, we just found uh, objects that were already in their classroom and started pretending that if they could talk, what would they say? There's some great books that would be uh, great provocation pieces, right? There's that book that talks about if a rock could sing. Um, would be a great one to bring into chatter picks with some rocks and seeing what the students want to have them say. Love the idea of the monthly portraits and having them talk. Cool. Awesome, Sue. Ooh, love that idea of the wordless picture books as well. So many possibilities there. Oh, cool. Really cool idea. The other one I was wondering about was, have you seen Sidewalk Flowers? It's a, a great little picture book, or those picture book. But I can see it also going up into some of the older grades. Uh, all of those books really would work for the early years. Leslie, I love that idea. I wonder even if you could have um, some of that reading in the environment where you could take some of their favorite words. Like I think when I think of my friends, they always knew words like Spider-Man and Minecraft and getting them to explain what those things are uh, and bringing in some of that letter and sound recognition. Awesome ideas, folks. Oh, 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 I love the tree sharing why they need to, why we need to take care of them. There's a great series for older kids called uh, The Earth is Speaking, where they have actual uh, actors speak in the voice of um, a piece of the environment. So one is the oceans, another is the rainforest, and it popped to mind as you uh, suggested that idea. Definitely a way that we can bring that play and that exploration into the older grades as well. But I love bringing it outside. And I think that's the real power of mobile technologies is that we're not limited to our four walls. And in the early years, we're so great about using all of those um, spaces that we can. Uh, so I think so many possibilities for us to explore. So I was going to share one of our big ahas with um, our inquiry last year. And it actually came to, into play with uh, the green screen exploration. And this was kind of funny because we actually hadn't planned on bringing green screen in. But as we were exploring our inquiry day, folks were so excited about green screen. And everybody kind of had that on their to-do list, something they wanted to explore with their friends. So it just became a natural part of our inquiry and allowed 
us to kind of follow that open exploration that we wanted to do with kids. So with one class, we did the traditional thing where you have the green screen up and friends come over. Um, and probably not um, the angle we wanted to have when we look at um, that play and that exploration. So I know there were definitely things I could have done differently. But it was interesting because there was one friend in particular where the green screen really allowed him to get into character and to do some of that sociodramatic play. So he was all about ghosts and haunted houses at the time. And it was funny how the green screen just gave him this environment to start um, getting into character and the vocabulary that was coming out. And I realized how much the digital tool can maybe be that spark that just pushes the learning ahead a little bit. Now for our second group, we actually ended up just working with a small group of friends that was interested. And they were into singing. They had a song that they were kind of exploring. And we really wanted the students to lead that exploration. So we set up this really weird contraption with boxes uh, so that the iPad was in front of them so that we weren't recording, but that they were taking control of that recording. Uh, so it was really cool because I don't think I ever noticed how much uh, the students were able to engage through that feedback. So we had some friends that traditionally don't interact with the group being able to interact with the group because they had that visual feedback from the green screen. Um, we had some other friends that were syncing with their colleagues, syncing with their K buddies uh, in their dance moves because they could see themselves on the screen. So there was this feedback loop that was happening in the play that we don't often see without that um, screen, which was a really interesting way of seeing the tool uh, kind of enhance that exploration. But one of my favorite parts of that green screen exploration was our friend's shirt here. Uh, and it was kind of funny because they just started uh, giggling. And <laughs> as they started giggling, they kept on talking about that he was see-through and he, was, he had a hole in him. So we started talking about that, uh, why does he have a hole in him? Is it really a hole? And it was funny because I didn't have to say anything. They just said, because it's green which uh, started a really interesting conversation around colors uh, because, of course, I came in with that other question and I just said, but your friend's pants are green. And it was pretty comical because the, the friend piped back and she said, well, actually, they're turquoise. They're not green. Uh, and she just schooled me in my colors. So it was interesting to see how much the kids already understood about tone um, and those color schemes as we were exploring and engaging in the green screen um, time. I think for me, the biggest aha was when we went to the next classroom and we explored with Floridale. So traditionally with green screen, we put the green screen up on the wall. Kids stand in front of it. Oftentimes, we're doing the recording or a friend is doing the recording. And I had done green screen with a lot of kindergarten friends, and a lot of kindergarten friends were the directors. But it always was kind of that standing up. So the Floridale crew had this awesome inquiry going on around uh, forests. And they had created their own forest with loose parts in their classroom. And we really wanted to see how could we use the green screen um, to enhance that exploration. So it was interesting because you can kind of see here we started um, putting it on the floor and in the wall in the background. Uh, one of our friends, and I don't know, I don't know, I don't have the picture of him. One of our friends was wearing a green jacket. So he was just super excited that he had a forest jacket and ended up running outside so we could test the boundaries of the Apple TV um, and all of those explorations that typically happen. But for me, what kind of changed the thinking for me was that we actually laid a green screen uh, just down along the floor. And I don't know why I never thought of this before, but it was interesting to see how once we put the green screen on the floor, our friends could manipulate the space a lot better. So one of our friends ended up walking in the forest. Another ended up swimming with a turtle. Um, because the, the surface was flat, they now could interact and explore more in that space. Then the other thing we started exploring was the use of our materials. Did it really need to be a huge green uh, background? Or could we use these green infinity scarves? So you can see our 
uh, educator here was using it to cover herself up. We found these green socks that became puppets for us so we could put some of our characters into the scene and create a movie. Uh, we started looking at them for creating water within our forest, uh, volcanoes, and lava in some of our dinosaur explorations. And then it was interesting to see how the green screen exploration led us to other tools like Noisily. Uh, so Noisily is a background sound tool. Um, and since we were exploring uh, the forest and some of that conversation, it kind of led us to Noisily to see what would the best background music be for that inquiry exploration we kind of set up. And for me, it was really interesting because it forced me to rethink even a tool that I thought I knew really well um, and see how the tool could be used differently as we tried to integrate it into those playful experiences. So that was kind of our exploration with green screen. I don't know if anybody had a similar idea or has a question about that exploration that they want to ask. I'm all ears. See a few folks are typing there, so we'll just give them a second. Uh, amazing possibilities at Dollarama. Uh, I know a lot of times when people talk about green screen, they have these really fancy green screens with stands. Um, and that's what we actually found out from our friends that were doing the dance, was we didn't need that. We actually, <laughs> we actually used a green tablecloth from Dollarama, one of the thicker ones which was awesome. You want that material that is thicker because if the light shines through, um, you won't be able to um, really distinguish the different shades. Um, and then the all the other items you see there from the socks to the infinity scarves, um, even these cheap Dollarama tablecloths that are in the party section, uh, all of those came from Dollarama. So I kind of have like a go-to bin that I use when we go do green screen. Uh, Mel, we're going to, if you are in Peel, I know we have pop-ups this Thursday for the early years. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get it booked in time, but we'll be doing an open materials exploration in January. So that will be available. And unfortunately, you're not in my group of schools, but we can definitely chat. And if you are up, um, oh, awesome. Maybe we can do it with the EYC planning group then. Just a slight, small sidebar there for us Peel folks. Um, but a great time to say that was the other thing that I really learned from the learning experience was how awesome it was to learn in our context, so while we were engaged in play. So our learning and our conversations beforehand, um, we thought stop motion was going to be the tool that really worked for the kids. And as we tried stop motion, we realized um, similar to uh, some of the stories people were sharing, like Michelle, of things not going quite, like the, doing video with them and them all shouting. Uh, stop motion, they just weren't into it. So it became this really psychedelic puppet show kind of thing, uh, where the green screen seemed to be the right fit for the play that they were engaging in at the moment. So a really interesting exploration. Uh, so one of my next steps is looking at how digital tools can really help with the spark. So a few weeks ago, we actually did a OTF session on sparking inquiry with digital provocations. So one of the colleagues was is working with kindergarten, and she actually shared uh, one of the sparks she was using, uh, and we were looking for some other ideas. So her friends were really into building, and we were looking at using something like Google Matrix as a way to spark maybe um, some different styles of building or to challenge them in creating taller buildings. So um, they have the amazing uh, Khalifa building in Dubai on Google Matrix. So you can actually take a whole 360 view, look at how tall it is, and using that as a provocation to perhaps enhance their explorations uh, in the building area. 
So I think that's really one for me um, and how we can make it, again, a seamless piece of the learning so that it doesn't become the main part of it, but that it just really enhances, extends, and enriches that learning experience. More than anything, I think I always go back to the Karen Callahan clip uh, where she speaks about being provocateurs. If you haven't checked out the clip, I think it's amazing. Uh, her provocateur piece uh, starts at the minute 40 mark. Uh, hopefully I got that right. Yep, a minute 40 mark. So if you look at, watch the clip, she really talks about our role as provocateurs and asking those just right questions. Um, so how can we link the best digital tool that will push, extend, um, and enrich that play for our learners? So what we want to do with the next uh, few minutes, unless there's any questions, is we want to kind of brainstorm some ideas. So we're going to try to do something a little different and funky here. I'm going to try to sketch it out on the iPad. Um, but to do this, we need a couple different play experiences that are happening in your exploration right now. Kindergarten, grade one, grade two, whatever works for you. Is there a topic you're exploring? Um, is there a play area that your kids are really, is there a topic they're passionate about? Dinosaurs. Um, I'm trying to think what, I've had a lot of friends into robots and coding. Uh, one friend was saying they were into zombies. That's a bit hard for me. Uh, cars and ramps. Cool. Uh, so if you drop those ideas in there, oh, that's awesome. We'll have to do cars and ramps. We already have two people that are kind of into that. Fidget spinners. Awesome. Towers, tall towers. Cool. So what we're going to try to do is we are going to think about those interests, think about what open materials we could use, and then perhaps try to think of digital tools that would help with that, if that's cool with you guys. So I'm just going to switch over. Interesting. Thank you, guys. Keep those coming. I'm just going to switch over while we're chatting. And we're just going to get this up again. Thank you for your patience. Sorry it's not as smooth, but hopefully it will be a good opportunity. Fishing. That's interesting. All right, so hopefully you guys see my iPad again. We are going to use an app called Paper 53, which is just an app I use to doodle, and I tend to do some sketch notes. So we got this ready here. Uh, so I'm just going to get my pencil tools ready. And I think maybe we can brainstorm first what ideas oops, we can do for buildings, since it seems like a lot of friends like the building idea. I'll take that one out. So maybe what are some of the open materials you guys are currently using for building? So I'm guessing blocks are a big tool. Draw some of these in. Ooh, cardboard. So blocks, cardboard. Oh, the rocks. I'm loving that with the rocks. I'm going to try to draw rocks here. It's not going to be very perfect. Kapla box. A little. My attempt. <laughs> You're going to have to forgive my amateur drawings here. So just looking at a lot of those materials uh, and which apps would kind of fit into that, I'm wondering if actually one app that may be really cool to integrate would just be the camera. 
Has anybody used the time lapse feature on the camera yet? So one of the options in the camera is to actually use time lapse. So it would just be on the side while you're recording that it says time lapse. And what it will do is it will actually take pictures as you're building um, and turn them into a video clip. Awesome, Melanie. Did your friends like it? So I think that would be a really simple way of kind of documenting our process and reflecting on the process afterwards. So another piece we could do is definitely turn it into a stop motion. Um, so time lapse kind of does it for us. But my favorite app for stop motion would be Stop Motion Studio. Uh, and we actually got into Stop Motion Studio. Uh, I'm not doing a very good job with that in illustration there. Um, we were looking at it for even capturing students' process in the arts. So as they're drawing, as, as they're capturing. But I'm wondering if we could, yeah, great point, Melanie. And that's the thing, when they're building for such a long period, it's hard for them to really watch that whole video, where time lapse or stop motion really gives us a chance to uh, reflect on the whole process. What we were saying would be interesting with um, time lapse or stop motion as well would be seeing who goes into that area to play and who leaves and the interactions between them. Um, it would be interesting just to see if people come, maybe come visit for short periods, but we don't always capture them in that exploration area. Uh, the other one I'm wondering, though, is if we did look at something like Chatterpicks Kids, could they tell us about their buildings and have their buildings come to life a little bit? Does anybody have any other suggestions? I can't draw Chatterpicks Kids right now. <laughs> I should know how to draw this, but. It kind of looks like it. I don't know. This is so bad. I'll have to fix Chatterpicks kids before we <laughs> before we tweet this out for you guys. I usually cheat and look at the app while I'm doodling it. So three apps we could think of. So time lapse, stop motion, Chatterpicks kids. The other thing that comes to mind is the Not a Box book, especially if you're using the cardboard. Uh, they have some great buildings in there. And wouldn't it be cool to either use the note feature right within the iPad, uh, the new annotation features. So whether you're drawing in an app, uh, in your photos, there's three dots. And then that leads you to a little toolbox, which lets you draw right on the picture. Uh, so kind of built-in sketch. sketch. Uh, but then there's also Puppet EDU, which will let you use a little magic wand on top of it while you're drawing. So we can kind of bring those ideas to life. And that's supposed to be a bunny. We're going with it, folks. Uh, Puppet EDU is free. Always go for the full version. It just has no um, in-app purchases, which means it's a bit easier to go with. Cool. All right, that's awesome for that. Let's look for another idea on our list. Thanks, Trish. So another idea. Mm, we had the fidget spinners and the cars. How about we do the transportation idea and maybe brainstorm some ideas there? So we're going to do a little car over here. All right, and I'm going to do a paper airplane because that's, uh, hopefully it kind of looks like a jet. Mm, doesn't quite look like an airplane, <laughs> but we'll go with it. Uh, this is what happens when you live sketch note. So maybe some of what materials uh, come to mind when you think of your cars and your transportation. Just drop them in the chat window. Yeah, I definitely think the ramps could be a great um, exploration with the friends, especially with your blocks. Tubes, yeah, we've seen a lot of that, haven't we? 
So I'm just going to try to draw. We did some little pathways like this one time right on top of our blocks. Ooh, measuring. That's my tape measure, folks. Hopefully that's OK. I think this would be a really great one to bring in our robots. So something like Dash, Dash actually has a bunch of sounds built into them. Uh, so we can turn Dash into a car and use some of those open materials within um, our room to create um, kind of a community for him to go through. And one of the cool things with Dash, if you are using the coding, is that you can actually, uh, as you're coding, you're bringing in that measurement. It works in centimeters, but the friends don't really need to know that if they um, if they're not exploring that yet. Some of our older primary early years would kind of explore that, but maybe not like everybody. I'm loving that positional language, uh, and that positional language and that exploration is actually making me think of Scratch Junior. And I know there's been lots of coding conversations and chats, um, but Scratch Junior is fantastic. And one of their opening um, activities, I guess you could say, uh, one of their opening challenges on their website is actually getting a car to drive. That doesn't quite look like Scratch. Uh, but another way for us to get into that positional language, one of the grade one classes two years ago, we got into um, coding on a map of the community. And these guys were so funny. They loved GPS. Um, <laughs> and uh, they ended up, we used uh, all the positional words within their code because they were just so obsessed with being the GPS. So we made Scratch the GPS on their maps. It was pretty um, awesome. I think, again, we could bring in that stop motion um, if we wanted to as an app to kind of enhance, especially if our friends are really um, enjoying playing with cards, but cards, but maybe we want them to get into more of that storytelling. Uh, and maybe that's Chatter Picks Kids as well, that we can bring that in. And again, my bunny rabbit keeps looking worse and worse, but that's okay. Just looking at time, uh, maybe we'll do one more here uh, before we bring it back together. There's so many great ones. And maybe I'll just put um, the fidget spinners over here. And I can always add some more ideas uh, before we share this on social media. And I love that fishing exploration. Oops. With fishing, I'm wondering about uh, just even some of those open materials. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Uh, and I've had some practice. Uh, with the fishes, I'm wondering about even the Kaleida cam. If we bring some of those uh, items from the beach and letting them remix them into different artwork, uh, how the kids would respond. I'm thinking about some of the Chatter Picks kids, but I'm also wondering about using it as a spark. Ooh, a great idea, a spark in the water table. And I'm wondering if that would be a great place for us to bring video in as a provocation. So um, green screen, yeah, be awesome for green screen, especially the flat idea that we talked about, and bringing in some uh, open materials into that exploration. I'm also wondering about some videos as provocations. So National Geographic and so Kids has some amazing clips. And there's also a lot of 360 video. So YouTube has video right now where you can actually turn around and walk around. I know that doesn't sound super exciting. Uh, but they actually have one on sharks that we've done with some primary classrooms, which makes them all go wow. Um, but it's just all of that 360 video and how that could be a provocation. But loving the idea of using it for green screen. 
And I think the green screen is actually my favorite green screen app would be G Wink. Um, if I had to choose one, it's just such an awesome app and open ended um, and easy for our primary friends to get dive right in, like we talked about. And I'll put that in after. For the fidget spinners, uh, the reason that really came to mind was Soul Pancake actually has a whole, um, a dude that just makes videos on how to build with Lego. Uh, thank you, Trish. Oh, love that, Naomi, bringing in some of those reading materials. And that's where QR codes can be a really great tool to bring in um, to facilitate that exploration. So if you've never seen QR codes, they're those little squares that look really funky because they have all these little black symbols. I did it the wrong way around. Um, it doesn't really look like a QR code, does it? <laughs> uh, but QR codes can really help us build that independence with our friends and that exploration. But just looking at the time, our brainstorming is kind of coming, time is kind of coming to an end. Uh, I love the idea of using the link cubes. I'm also wondering about uh, the Kaleidocans and having the fidget speeder spinners spinning, what um, what would the Kaleidocam capture and what would those colors look like? Or could we use the Kaleidocam to create a picture that looks like the fidget spinners spinning? I know I was in a class last week and one of the friends was using their connects to make their fidget spinner. Uh, and another person broke the rules completely and created her own, which was super cool. Thank you guys for trying that with me. It's the first time I've ever doodled the brainstorm, but I'll finish the sketch note up uh, tomorrow morning for sure, and I'll tweet it out, uh, and then we'll try to include it in the notes. So let me just stop sharing here for a second, and we'll go to our last page as our time's coming to an end. So hopefully, as we've been exploring, you've found some new ideas, um, some provocations or invitations to try a different um, exploration with your friends. Hopefully, we've seen that really digital tools can play a part in helping us see those competent and capable learners um, and see that digital tools really become part of that natural play environment uh, and not just something extra or different. Um, but you guys have been awesome, so awesome to learn from all of your great ideas. And now I have lots of great ideas to brainstorm and finish up myself. Would love to connect anytime you want. So again, my info is there. Um, connect anytime. And uh, I'll take any last minute questions if you have them. Thank you guys all so much for participating. I know it's a always busy time. Okay, I'm going to jump back in here. This is Trish again, uh, your moderator. And uh, while Tina uh, follows the chat for any questions, i just let you know that I've got a few things to say. Um, I will be turning off the recording shortly. I'm just going to wait and see if any more questions show up in there. But uh, we do count on your feedback, so I'm going to pop into the chat a uh, couple of links for you. Where I'm going to try to, anyway. Uh, There we go. So you will get a certificate once you complete the feedback form. And there's also going to be a resource page. I've been copying and pasting those on there, so that'll show up. And just to keep in mind, Tina does other webinars as well. And you can find those in the OTF calendar. And uh, so I don't see any questions in there. I'm going to just say, wow, Tina, that was amazing. I can hardly wait to use Kaleidocam. And I'm not even a K-2 teacher anymore. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. It's just, Hi. it's a good party app. <laughs> sure sounds like it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to uh, say thank you once again. I'm going to turn off the recording now.